Hello and welcome to Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Euler. I'm your host, Brad Wilder. This is part two of a two-part series with none other than Tasmanian Jenny King. Jenny is not only a psychotherapist, she's also, well, an educator and uh, a heck of a, a researcher too. She comes with a diverse background and in our first part we discussed gender affirming care and there's still so much more to cover we thought one part wasn't going to be enough so we jumped in with a second part john euler is here today with us as well john it's always great to have you on the show uh so much to talk about um you and jenny uh last time spoke about you know everything that needs to be discussed with gender affirming care but we you know we um we delve into each topic so deep that it requires more time and more effort to get into the real nitty gritty of what this is all about. So where does today's show head and what's about to, to come up, John? Brad, thank you as always. And we sort of left part one a cliffhanger at a point. We have Jenny King, a genuine professional. She is a registered nurse. She's been a psychotherapist for years. She has been working with one of the most challenging of populations as far as mental health, which are eating disorders, and that is so pertinent and applicable to the trans movement because really that, that comprises the a population of kids that are very wounded, significant mental health issues. There's about nine key red flag clinical indicators. Oftentimes it's trauma related, very often it's sexual abuse, and also a significant percentage of those kids that are being manipulated into, recruited into the cult-like aspect of the trans movement. Jenny King uh, helped us understand and see the relationship. We talked about the relationship between cults and the trans movement as far as recruitment and retention. And she was beginning to introduce with her registered nurse background, the health effects of the application of cross sex or puberty blockers and we're going to pick up where we left off jenny thank you so much for being here because you're going to lay out you're going to pick up where we left off this is a moving sidewalk as, as far as the trans movement if a kid gets recruited if a kid gets emotionally and uh, mentally uh, manipulated into this movement parents need to understand it's heading somewhere and there's very predictable stages. It starts with the social transitioning. If they want to go back and find out what that is, you laid that out beautifully. Then it's going to transition to the next stage, which is the medicalization. And the first stage of that are puberty blockers because that starts young. Jenny, continue with your list. I encourage people to go back and listen to part one because you you started to list off medical facts and details about the dangers of puberty blockers. So pick it up at that point. Sure, sure. So I've got a list of the complications and side effects. Some of these are due to hormones, some are due to puberty blockers, and some are due to surgery. But to start with, with, with testosterone in girls, you're going to get gross clitoral, clitoral enlargement. So the clitoris starts to enlarge. In some cases, it ends up extending beyond the labia, the lips of the vagina, and then rubs against the jeans the girl is wearing and will start bleeding. So that it becomes like a micro penis. And it becomes painful and abnormal looking. So then also another side effect of testosterone is that the, the girl, when she does have sex, if she does, can have terrible pain in her uterus on orgasm. And that's a horrendous side effect. We've also got body hair. Suddenly the girl's going to have body hair. And these are permanent changes. You're going to have permanent facial hair. You're going to have baldness in a girl. Now, how can this be good for someone with poor self-esteem who's a self-harmer, which most of these girls have got those sort of issues? You're going to have loss of breasts if you have a mastectomy, and a lot of girls are having them as early as 12 or 13. You're going to have loss of normal sex genitalia. Your normal genitals are going to be damaged permanently in many cases by testosterone and then by surgery, you know. 
and you're exchanging them for non-functional pseudo genital genitals genitals created by surgeons and if you see any of the pictures of these kind of surgeries or the results they're absolutely horrific people can't even stand to look at them they're so appalling um then you've got the need for a colostomy bag now what effect is that going to have on a kid because often because of other side effects kids can end up with incontinence or young adults end up with incontinence because when you start messing around with the whole urine, ur urinary system and the genitals, things go awry, not surprisingly. So you can end up with incontinence of both urine and feces, and you can end up with fistulas. I don't know if you know what a fistula is, but it's a whole, a communicating channel between the urethra or the vagina and the rectum. So poo can come out of the vagina. These Gosh, are bad. Let me, let me start, hold on, ready? <laughs> You know, I've been in the field while I'm talking to Pratt, right? Okay, this is why we're doing this. Yeah. Right? Because the whole we're going to talk about affirmative care, affirmation care, and what politicians are doing. They're they're outlawing regular therapy. Okay. It, what what isn't being talked about is yeah. the one of the primary concepts in the world of mental health. Any kind of treatment is informed consent right? right to be to be able to make fully informed consent that's a legal term yeah me to be able to adequately say yes even as an adult right the, the whether you see it in uh, pharmaceutical commercials or all the uh, the side effects might be well up they come and you don't mm. know if the cure is worse than the disease or vice versa okay yep so, so they are required, uh, health professionals, mental health professionals, we are required to give somebody enough information with which to make an informed decision. And that also means this, that they can comprehend it, that, that it sinks in. Exactly. Okay, so we're talking about kids. We're talking about minors. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't give a firearm to a little kid. Or, you know, we don't, we don't let them smoke. Right, because kids may think it's cool if a kid on the playground is you know walking a kid through a park and he finds a cigarette butt. What you're going to let your kid just put it in your mouth? We go, no, 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 buddy. And now we've got to start to explain. No, here's tobacco. Here's, this, these are the effects. Well, we know a kid can't comprehend. A kid is influenced by peer culture. Okay, so the reason I felt compelled to to interrupt is I really want parents to understand. And you know what, parents. Let your young people listen to this. Sit them down, right? Because they're being unduly influenced. Oh, it's no big deal. You're just going to go through top surgery. You're just really okay. No, they need to know all the potential complications. And Jenny, as you're describing this, the colostomy bag. Hello, that'll stop the trans movement right there. <laughs> okay, so pick that back up about what potentially happens because. Part of the surgery, especially for boys, but also for girls, because they're going to make false or fake penises. We haven't even gotten to that. You're going to talk about skin grafts. But, yep. okay, so we're talking that if a child is permitted, if a minor is permitted to get on this moving sidewalk and undergo some of these surgeries, so tell us again, there's the chance of a colostomy bag? Absolutely. There's a chance of a colostomy bag, and there's a chance of permanent urinary incontinence, there's a chance of ongoing urinary tract infections. So, for instance, Scott Nugent, who had surgery as, as a, an adult woman to become a man, he has chronic urinary infections. And he said, she, I should say, because she recognises that she's a woman, she's going to die from those urinary tract infections eventually. They're going to kill her. So if you have a phalloplasty, that means creating a false penis in a woman they take flesh from the arm or from the thigh and they sort big, of turn it into a big into skin sausage. graft. They take a skin Massive graft. Massive skin graft. So you end up with a flayed arm that looks abnormal. And sometimes people get neurological problems in their arm. They can't use their arm properly anymore. And it also looks really, really, really abnormal. And they turn it into a sort of sausage and try to create a urinary, a urethra, the weighing tube in the middle of that, and then uh, attach it to the woman's pelvis to look now, like jenny, a pelvis. jenny what term okay so for women for young yeah. girls for females for teen girls yeah. they're going to be encouraged so first they're going to go through puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones yeah. 
And now these surgeries, and in order, yeah. we got top surgery and bottom yeah. surgery. Parents are hearing these terms. So yeah. it's typically going to be top surgery first and bottom surgery. Yeah. So using the correct medical terminology, tell parents. So first, it's going to be top surgery. So top tell surgery. them what that Let's is and, the, and then bottom surgery. Okay. So top surgery is having your breasts removed and girls as young as 12 are doing that. And that has a lot of side effects too, because these girls don't realize later on they might want children and they might want to breastfeed. And it's heartbreaking for them when they realize I do want to have a baby and I can't breastfeed my baby. I don't have breasts anymore. They don't realize that because they're too young to make that decision when they do make the decision. So now, top surgery is a double is mastectomy. mastectomy. Double mastectomy. Yep. And bottom surgery, which actually only about 13% of girls sign up for bottom surgery thank goodness but that is the creation of a false penis it looks like something frankenstein dr frankenstein would come up with and it has something like a 67 percent complication rate and some of those complications include gangrene in this pretend penis and the penis falling off and it, almost always the penis is not functional so it's it's an a, horrific surgery that no one should be having no one should be having because the complications of fistula meaning that communicating channel between your um your rectum and your your new urethra is very very serious sepsis meaning septicemia blood poisoning in your whole body that has a very high fatality rate septicemia and dysfunction of the organ the organ becoming gangrenous like i said and it just has a phenomenally bad effect. Blood clots are another side effect. So Scott Nugent, who had this phalloplasty surgery as an adult woman, um, ended up with terrible blood clots and terrible septicemia or total blood poisoning with infection, which led him to have a heart attack he nearly died from. And he currently has, um, it takes him 10 minutes to go to the toilet, he says, there'll be urine everywhere because those those parts of the body have been so damaged by this insane surgery that he can no longer urinate in a normal way. Urine will end up everywhere. So all these side effects are just not not explained or described when people get on the trans train. I don't usually like to jump in, but I have to for a moment because I'm, I'm scratching my head dumbfounded. Um, part of this movement is to make feel people feel comfortable in their own bodies. Another movement is the sexual aspect of things. Another aspect is the mental health side of it. And there's so many different aspects. But let's talk just briefly, and I, I bring this up only because that doesn't sound like anybody's going to be having better sex at all. Well, no, they're not, Brad. They're not going to be having any sex. This is the thing. You're taking functional, healthy genital organs and replacing them with these Frankenstein meat Lego organs that don't work properly. And that's for boys and girls, for men and women. Generally, they don't work well because medical science can't create functional sex organs. They can only create the appearance of opposite sex organs. So I'm and even people... I was going to say, Go I'm ahead. assuming now that AIDS is still a big part of this too going forward, and that's part of the... It was part of the gay lifestyle for so many years, and obviously um, that that hasn't gone away. I think that you know yeah. while they've got maybe a treatment to slow it down, I I don't think that there's necessarily um, a treatment to make it better or go away. Right. So, um, right. what what's well, going to happen there? Well, something interesting, someone on Twitter did a, a little table showing what sort of sex people can have after they've had gender transition. And mostly they can't have gender. A lot of them can't have genital sex anymore because those organs have been damaged so much and their new organs don't function. So all that's really left to them is anal sex. And I, I really wonder if, because anal sex is being pushed on kids in schools nowadays, yep. it, it all seems to tie together that these kids can end up as sort of, I think of them as almost ending up like a kind of sex toy for pedophiles because they've been- there, there, Jenny, Jenny I, I could not concur more. That's why, again, unmasking the trans movement is not anti anything. We are pro the protection of children and, and women, vulnerable women and children. And 
what is behind this to a significant extent, you have financial predators, you have very darkened uh, special interests, meaning with darkened motives, secondary gains. And so you have uh, financial predators, which are the medical, you have big pharma, but you have sexual predators. And if you consign a child, a young person, then a teen, that all they're ever going to be able to do is be on the receiving end of potentially very deviant older individuals, that's what you consign them to for the rest of their lives. You will continue to traumatize them because the anus was not designed for penises. Right. Exactly. And you've also got people who look like children to one degree or another because you've arrested their development. So, of course, that really appeals to pedophiles. A childlike body, often with no breasts, you know, and, and for some boys, they're having penectomy and orchiectomy. That means their penis and testicles are being removed. So, you know, that's like a dream come true for some sexually deviant older men. Anything else about the physical? Okay. There's so much more. And we're going yep. to, beyond this program, we're going to have you back and we're going to be able to methodically really expand on these concerns. But... I'm envisioning beyond this, we've got the social, what happens to a child, what happens to this dating yeah. life, this social, we got the psychological, what happened? So keep talking. Sure. So we see let's, with let's testosterone. Start at the begin, let's start at the beginning again, please. If you just start in with so, go ahead in three, two, and one. So psychologically, we see a lot of harm from puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones and surgery. We see an increase in self-harm behavior. We actually see an increase in suicidality. We see an increase in aggression. We see an increase in psychosis. Uh, we see an increase in agitation. And we see an uh, increase in psychiatric diagnosis. So some of these girls end up in a psychiatric hospital because it is mostly girls, like I said, 88% of treatment uh, recipients are girls. And then they acquire all these diagnoses and they end up on a lot of psychiatric meds. And nobody says, oh, maybe it's the testosterone. So you've got that risk in itself. They end up with PTSD because you have traumatized them by mutilating their body. They end up often with disgust with their new body too. We have the case of Nathan Verhelst, a Belgian uh, a woman who became uh, transitioned to become a man and ended up choosing euthanasia because she was so horrified with her new body and her penis that didn't work and she thought of herself as a monster. We have another one in Canada who's who's signed up for the MAID program, the medically assisted euthanasia program in Canada because she's appalled at what she's done to herself. Well, sorry, it's it. Duchess Lois was a man, is a man, who had transition surgery, and she's horrified. He's horrified. Sorry, it does get confusing, doesn't it? Yeah, he's right, horrified the, at what, that's right, what he's that's done right. to And himself. Jenny, this is going to be, we're going to do another program on this because this is the, the one of the dirty little secrets that the, the push toward euthanasia, that you take kids, and how, mu how much more dangerous can this be that if a child has been perped on, if a young teen has been perpetrated against, sexually offended against, very often they want to keep the name and the reality of the perpetration to themselves. So in a way, we can call this facet of it where the kid kind of awakens also a buyer's remorse. And now they, they were already depressed, they're already fragile, they're already vulnerable. And now why am I going to live? Um, my contention is this is the ultimate of the silence of the lambs. Yes. And now it's state sanctioned because now we're going to pay for uh, euthanasia for these kids and eventually phys physician assisted. And then pretty soon you're only going to need one physician's signature. It always goes in that direction. So I can and get both going. of you caught up in this right now. Um, that's happening here in Canada already. Yes. Yes. It's terrible. It's absolutely horrific what's happening. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, we made a mistake with that one. So we'll let we'll let him or her kill themselves. It's sort of like an embodiment of the saying, doctors bury their mistakes. And perpetrators you know? can ensure silence. Exactly, exactly. 
And there's lots of ways in which that's happening too, because a lot of unhappy transitioners don't want to come out and say this was a mistake because then they will lose their community, their cult community. They'll have no friends and they'll be called a, a transphobe and a turf and they'll be abused and, you know, they will be pushed to suicide too for daring to go against the cult belief system. So, you know, socially and psychologically there are so many bad effects and, and not least of which is the betrayal of a child's right to be a child. Instead of a parent being the arbiter of reality, the parent is going, oh, well, if you believe you're a boy, you must be a boy. Now, that's very harmful to children because suddenly there's no boundaries, there's no reality, there's only feelings. And that's a terrifying state for a child to have the burden of figuring out what's real. No child should be put in that position. That's a parent's duty to, to be the arbiter of reality and to reflect, yes, your intuitions are right. That drag queen at drag queen story hour is a man. But you see, we're just systematically confusing and disorienting children and trying to dissociate them from biological reality through As social we media. The last 10 well, minutes, where do you want to take this, John? I think, uh, you know, we've, we've had two great sessions already and uh, we can kind of can come to conclusion here with our last 10 minutes of this program and kind of wrap this one up. And there's so much more to discuss with Jenny in the future too, like you mentioned already. We're going to have Jenny back. These are all, as it were, as they say in some industry, these are teasers, but not in a, we're not flippantly. We do. We're, as you just not, referenced. John, we're not flippantly what? Oh, froze again. Hold on. Okay, we Fred, froze, froze again. We're going to do this. Not flippantly in three, two, and one. We don't say this flippantly, but we want people to understand there are there's a lot to unpack with each of this. You are just skimming the circuit, the surface, Jenny. So we're so appreciative. But as you indicated, it's very scary for a child to sort of almost be in charge of. So the child is encouraged that if they feel a certain way, then they they're they're encouraged to move in a certain way, and then the parents and good protective people are no longer protecting them. They have to stand back and affirm. Talk to parents, talk to good people, talk to grandparents about your concerns about affirmation therapy and then what is coming from that as far as some of the laws. Talk to us about your concern. Describe what affirmation therapy is and your concerns about that. Sure. So the term affirmation therapy to me is a contradiction in terms because therapy is not about affirming people's beliefs. I mean, like Lisa Marciano, who's a very good Jungian therapist who's gender critical, says that, say, if she gets a, a male patient who says he's going to kill himself because his wife left him, we don't say, oh, yeah, that's right, you've got nothing to live for anymore. And we don't say, I'm going to ring your wife and tell her to come back to you. You know, we don't affirm. We help explore. Therapy is about exploring and trying to come to the right conclusions and helping a person understand themselves. So... The fact that therapists and doctors and others, even parents, are under pressure to affirm means we're all being forced to take part in this cult belief system, whether we believe in it or not, and we're all being forced to ignore the reality of all the harms being done by this whole belief system and by the whole process of gender transition. So it's really quite almost totalitarian to impose affirmation. And the fact that it's being imposed particularly on psychotherapists and clinicians means that, say, if I got a client. My doctor says Hold I am on. a boy. Say if I, so, so if I have a client in three, two, and one. So if I have a client who's a girl who has been persuaded through indoctrination that she's really a boy. And if I was to say to her, well, let's explore that. Why do you think you're a boy? What What's happening in your life? What other issues are, are you having? If I'm just using exploratory psychotherapy techniques, I will be accused by trans activists of engaging in conversion therapy because apparently my duty is just to put a rubber stamp on this belief system and, and send that person off for medical treatment. So it's, it's very demoralizing and disrespectful to therapists. It's just saying, we're just a rubber stamp. Your job is to send that person off so they can have medical treatment. 
So it's really and disastrous. That, and that also then leaves the client, the young person, the troubled teen, um, again, feeling additionally anxious because deep down inside, this child wants help. And if all they're told is, well, yeah, it sure sounds like, can you imagine, I, I'm, I'm depressed, feel like killing myself. Well, it sounds like you're depressed, want to kill yourself. So there's a bridge over there, right? Well, you know, far be it for me to begin to help you. So this is the only um, issue in the whole wide world that a therapist can't do what a therapist normally does. So if somebody comes in saying, I have panic attacks, you know, or, you know, I feel like killing myself, and you just reference that, every therapist is trained to help try to secure safety, right? To, to do no harm and then to help get to the root. Where did this start? But isn't it interesting with this one uh, facet that that's the only thing we can never help a young person explore, despite the fact that there are nine red flag clinical indicators that speak to that this young person has been sexually traumatized and who benefits from that the perpetrator that's why it's a significant concern it's a huge concern for those of us that care about young people care about the safety and we are mandated reporters jenny if there is a parent out there if there's a grandparent in about two minutes left the time uh, the clock is not our our uh, friend at this point but again we're going to have you back uh, what would you what what would you in three two and one my advice what, to a parent what's your message oh, sorry my advice sorry, to a we're parent start is... again start again three you're gonna say uh what was that john um yeah what is your question. message yep three, yeah, what is your... two and one Jenny, what is your message to parents or grandparents or extended family or good people with respect to this? My advice would be to be loving and supportive and to accept the fact that your child has these belief systems, but to treat it as you would a child who had anorexia or a drug or alcohol problem. And maybe look into uh, organisations like Al-Anon, which help you learn how to be supportive without going along with something that's extraordinarily harmful and to be the basis of reality for your child. To make it clear, I do not believe in this and I will not enable it, but I do love you and care for you. My other advice would be to get as much information as you possibly can. Knowledge is power and to unite, to find other parents. So parent groups could be very helpful, support groups. There's a lot of good websites as well, like GenSpect and Transgender Trend. So get the information. Don't believe what you're told. Be extremely skeptical. Remember that doctors and therapists are not really on your side in this situation. Jenny, if anybody wants to reach out to you, they can certainly contact us at unmaskingthetransmovement.com. If they want to access any of your work, do you have a social media page? Oh, yes. We have a Facebook page called Attentive Watchful Waiting. So if they look that up on Facebook... And it's also on Getter, but um, most of our activity is on Facebook. So attentive, watchful waiting with the A, W and W capitalized, if I remember rightly. But anyway, you put it in, it'll probably come up. Penny, thank you for being a wealth of knowledge and information. We're going to have you back and we're going to unpack much more of this because your knowledge is uh, is something that people need to hear. So thank you so much for being a part of the program. Well, thank you very much, John and Brad. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you both for being on the show today. John, I know your time is limited. Uh, always great to talk with you. And uh, uh, Jenny, I hope you enjoy your summer down under because we are freezing up here in Canada. Thanks for watching, everybody. This is Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Euler. I'm your host, Brad Wilder. I'll see you next time.